Hello everybody. My name is Emma and I am the Engagement Officer at the Jewish Museum London. It is wonderful to be able to join with you all and Yom HaShoah UK to be able to mark this important day. At the Jewish Museum London, we care for objects that remember the Holocaust, that tell individual stories of those whose lives were affected. Our Holocaust Gallery tells the story of Leon Greenman, a British-born survivor of Auschwitz. His wife Elsa and his son Barney were both murdered in the Holocaust, and after liberation, Leon dedicated his life to telling his story. Alongside objects that tell the story of his life and family before the Holocaust and his experiences in the camp, we also have more recent objects of his in our collection. Artwork that he created about his experiences during the Holocaust. Artwork that gives us an insight into how he processed his loss. And here are not the only examples of artwork created by Holocaust survivors that we care for at the Jewish Museum London. In this talk today, myself and my colleagues would like to share with you artwork from our collection created by Holocaust survivors and explore the role of art in both supporting survivors in processing loss and also the importance of art as testimony, reminding future generations of atrocities that must not be forgotten. We would like to begin by exploring an example of the artwork of Liam Greenman. Here we can see a model made by him. This model shows the upper body of an Auschwitz prisoner leaning on a small brick wall. The loose bricks suggest that he's probably working on that wall. Work in the camps differed depending on which camp the prisoner was in, but heavy physical work, such as construction, was common in almost every camp. The model is wearing the typical blue white striped uniform of prisoners. Upon arrival, they were stripped of their own civilian clothing and were forced to wear a uniform. The belongings of the deported were sorted and either used within the camp or sold in Germany. Men were given a cap, trousers and a jacket, whereas women got a dress or a skirt, a jacket and a kerchief for their hat. On their feet, there were wooden, sometimes leather clocks without socks that led to injuries on their feet, like blisters or open sores, which often became infected due to the unhygienic conditions in the camp. In winter, the uniform's material was a little bit thicker and some prisoners were lucky enough to receive a sweater or a coat. Still, this was extremely inadequate protection from the cold. Leon Greenman made this model from experience. He was a Holocaust survivor and had been a prisoner in Auschwitz. I would now like to share a story with you, the story behind his making of this model. Leon was born in the East End of London in 1910 as the fifth of six children. After the early death, death of his mother, the family moved to Rotterdam where Leon's paternal grandparents lived. Leon left school at the age of 16 and became a hairdresser. He owned his own hairdresser saloon in East London by the age of 21. Back in London, he met Esther van Damme. They fell in love and were married in 1935. In our collection, we have this wedding picture of them, which was taken by the well-known East End wedding photographer, Horace Bennett. The newlywed settled in Rotterdam and Leon joined his father-in-law's bookselling business. In 1940, their son Barnett, who was also called Barney, was born. This picture shows Barney when he was two years old. He was registered as a British citizen at the British Consulate. Leon, Elsa and Barney all had British citizenship. In May 1940, the Nazis invaded the neutral Netherlands. Leon remembered the invasion, being out in the streets when the bombs began to fall. He ran home to his wife, Elsa, Barney and his grandmother-in-law. He found them at home, safe and unheard by the bombing. However, the Nazi invasion subjected the Dutch Jewish population to the same discriminatory laws as the German Jewish community. This photo shows the family in June 1942. It is a happy family photograph, despite the difficult situation they were living in. After the Nazi invasion of the Netherlands, the Greenman family saw their Jewish friends and neighbors disappearing. Leon and Elsa made the decision to give them most precious things 
to non-Jewish friends for safekeeping. This included their British passports. At some point, the friends became too scared of having Jewish things at their house, so that they burned the passports. This de decision was pivotal for the family. It left them unable to prove their British citizenship. Leon passed away in March 2008. He was dedicated to sharing his testimony, and I would now like to share this recorded testimony to continue his story. It was the 8th October 1942 when we were taken out of our homes. Two days later, we were put in a train and sent to Westerbork concentration camp, a camp in the north of Holland where every Jew in Holland had to register. And from there, they were sent to the various concentration camps. And so it was on the 17th, 18th, January 1943, that we were called up. A man called out the names. A hundred, two hundred or three hundred people had to dress and get ready for deportation. And I said to my wife, we got to stop next to Kurt Schlesinger and on the quick you tell him who we are. We're British, we need not go. Any moment we can receive documents proving it. She did this, he gave us less than a look, turned to Gemmeke and said, Das is abgewesen in Hagen und die mussten weg. That's been refused in The Hague and they've got to go. Through the gates we went into the waiting train an old-fashioned train, I can see all the doors, a lot of doors at the sides. And off we went to Auschwitz. And when the train stopped longer than otherwise, it went quiet. We were half asleep, half awake. And then I heard the voices of men going along the train. The rouse, the rouse, alles the rouse, schnell, schnell, alles liegen lassen. German commands to get out of the train on the quick and leave your luggage behind. We stood about 700 of us. Along comes an SS soldier with a club in his hands, puts the clubs between the men and the women and tells us, the women, to leave the man and go to the right. There goes my wife and child. When all of a sudden one of the women cries out, I hear her, I want to be with my husband. And she walks away from where she stood. And as I still can see it, gets behind the SS soldier. The man turns around and brings the club down on the woman's head. Down goes the woman to the ground and he kicks it in the tummy. The first criminal offence I've seen. A picture I'll never, never forget. And I can see on my right movement. And along comes a truck and the truck stops in front of us. And I can see a lot of heads of children and women, close up together, absolutely tight. And there's my wife and child in the middle. My wife could make her own clothes and from thick red velvet curtains, she had cut them up, made two garments, one for the baby and one for herself. Halfway the body, going upwards, but left the top into pointed heads and my eyes was looking at the two pointed heads. Then the truck moved away and I never saw them again. In Leon's interview, as he told his story, we saw behind him some art that Leon had painted himself. This shows a scene at Auschwitz which he described. 
a scene that would stay with him for the rest of his life. The moment of separation from his wife, Elsa, and his son, Barney. He never saw them again. Many of us will be familiar with photographs of Auschwitz, photographs that document the atrocities carried out there, photographs that show Jewish prisoners being separated from loved ones, many to be sent to the gas chambers. Whilst these photographs are extremely important in recording what took place, they are often taken from the perspective of the perpetrator. Through this painting, Leon shares his memories and documents the scene from the perspective of a Jewish person. He is actively choosing to record this moment from his life, sharing it from his perspective. Art is very powerful in conveying emotions and experiences. Through this painting, Leon has drawn the numerous faces of women and children packed together. It is a sea of faces. At the front, we can see the details in the expressions. But as the faces stretch back, they almost fade into one another. The difficulty of trying to find a loved one amongst so many is emphasized. There is a very real sense that we are looking at the memory of someone who was there as opposed to a photograph which shows the whole scene in equal detail this painting focuses on the faces near at the front the action taking place there is an awareness of what is going on beyond this the way we can be aware of what is happening in our peripheral vision but this is not where our attention is focused we are looking at what leon remembers looking at once again, through art, we can remember the Holocaust from the perspective of a Jewish man. Leon painted many scenes depicting his memory of the Holocaust. Difficult memories that stayed with him years after liberation. Let us turn to the model we looked at earlier. Leon made this when he was in hospital, suffering from depression. Whilst the liberation of the camps occurred over 75 years ago, this model reminds us that suffering did not end at this date. It was a long journey to try to rebuild lives. For Leon, after liberation, he tried to find his wife and son, only to discover that they had both been murdered in the gas chambers. On the train on which Leon was deported to Auschwitz, there were 700 people and just two survived, including Leon himself. He had survived, but the memories would always stay with him. Leon suffered from depression. Depression is characterized by persistent sadness and can cause intense emotions of anxiety, hopelessness, negativity and helplessness, which won't go away. Whilst in hospital, he made this model. It is very striking, the hunched shoulders, the cupped hands, the eyes wide open. Through this artwork, this model, Leon is conveying more than the uniform and inhuman work loan forced upon a prisoner. He is also sharing through this model, the emotions. This model is made by someone who was there who had worn that uniform and worked in dreadful conditions. It is very powerful to look at. Art is also powerful in allowing individuals to express trauma. Drawing, painting, sculpting are all means of expressing grief without needing to use words. Perhaps Leon used his artwork at that difficult time in hospital to provide an outlet for the grief and loss he was experiencing. Leon was by no means the only Holocaust survivor to share his testimony through art. Let us look at another individual 
Hans Jackson. Hans was born in Berlin in February 1921. His father and stepmother owned two textile shops in Berlin. He described his parents as very popular, both socially and as business people. However, in 1933, Hitler and the Nazi party came to power and there soon followed a boycott on Jewish shops. Hans Jackson passed away in 2012 and I would like to share an extract from an oral testimony recorded with Hans telling his story. My own experience was that in front of our shop was a group of Nazis which uh, sort of with, uh, with posters and placards which said do not buy with, by Jews, we do not buy from Jews, uh, help Germany by not buying from Jews. That was, that was the general meaning of these posters, as you will see, as you'll see on one of these paintings. In 1934, Hans had his bar mitzvah, and in the year following, he began training to become a cabinet maker and joiner. About three years later, he used his skills to work as a cabinet maker in his uncle's factory. However, throughout these years, discriminatory laws were passed against Jewish people, making life harder and more dangerous. However, emigration was difficult. The night of broken glass, or Kristallnacht, marked a turning point. This was a pogrom that took place on the 9th of November, 1938. Synagogues were burnt down, Jewish homes and businesses were damaged, and Jewish cemeteries were vandalized. 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to concentration camps. Hans Jackson describes his memories of Kristallnacht. Um, Kristallnacht to me and to my parents, my parents were not at home. We were both not at home. I wasn't at home. I can't remember where I was, but I might have been with a school friend which was still, I had some very, uh, what do you call, um, uh, uh, Protestant friends, one or two, and which was very close. I haven't got an idea. I only know that I was not at home during that point. Right. When we came back the next morning, we saw what damage was done to our property, to our shops, and to our, they were smashed and everything was lying in the street. A, what do you call it, the, the windows of our flat, which was just above one of our shops, were smashed. And uh, the only, I believe, that the porter of our building was not allowing the people to come in, which saved the, probably, uh, the, the complete destruction of it. Yeah. Well, this night was, uh, the signpost of the start, as I called it, the prelude to the Holocaust. Yeah. Because from that point, from that point onwards, we knew this. It, what the, any hopes that were ever held mm -hmm. of that things might not develop to uh, the extremes, all this was. He had to give up. You yeah. knew that from day, from this day onwards, mm -hmm. you had to learn how to walk on water. Following the events of the Night of Broken Glass, Britain launched a rescue mission which has become known as the Kinder Transport. Only children 16 years old and under were allowed to come and they would not be accompanied by their families. Hans, having been born in February 1921, was 17 years old, too old to be able to come to Britain on this rescue mission. He did, however, volunteer as a helper with the kinder transport and so witnessed the trains leaving. 
Hans Jackson was able to leave Germany to come to Britain, to the Kitchener camp. This was a camp set up by relief organisations to provide a temporary accommodation for German Jewish men while they waited for permission to emigrate elsewhere. Hans Jackson was taken to Australia on board the SS Denera. On the 10th of July 1940, 2,542 people deemed enemy aliens boarded the ship and were treated as the enemy. After the war ended, he was never able to find out exactly what had happened to his parents. All we can say with certainty is that they were murdered in the Holocaust. Throughout Hans Jackson's testimony and story, we shared with you a series of paintings that depict the scenes described. These were all painted by Hans Jackson. He took up painting during the war. However, this series of paintings that we shared were created later in life, after he had retired. They all form part of his collection, Prelude to the Holocaust. They paint scenes that he witnessed, a boycott on a Jewish shop, a synagogue burning down during the night of broken glass, a kind transport train leaving with families saying goodbye. The one exception was the painting of the group of people on board the Denera. This is part of a series of free paintings that he made about life during that voyage. They can almost be seen as an extension of the narrative of the prelude to the Holocaust. Let us look at another one of the paintings that forms the prelude to the Holocaust. This painting shows a Nazi raid on a Jewish home. At the foot of the painting are discarded objects the Nazis have thrown there. Amongst them is a tallit and what appears to be a religious book beside it. It is a very powerful painting by Hans Jackson. One noteworthy feature of his paintings is the emphasis he places on people. He depicts the events leading up to the Holocaust, showing people who played a role within it. The characters and personalities are conveyed very strongly in this painting. The fear of the child reaching up to their mother, the protective arm she places on their shoulder, the distress on her face. The busyness and action of the man on the left searching their home. The smile on the face of the Nazi in the doorway as he turns his gaze to the other men peering through the doorway with him. If the Nazi shown relaxed, bored, uninterested in the action around him. His attitude is at such odds with those of the family whose home is being searched. It is a very striking contrast. Such indignities and frightening experiences are an important part of the prelude to the Holocaust, important to remember and to remember what they led to. This type of event, the intrusion into Jewish houses, the searching and destruction of property is not unique, but happened numerous times. Yet because of the nature of these searches, the family having to gather under the watchful eye of the Nazis being shown here. There are a few photographs to record such events. And these photographs could never be taken by the Jewish families affected. As with Leon Greenman's paintings, Hans Jackson gives us something vitally important, a record of these atrocities from the perspective of someone Jewish. Hans Jackson had lived through the experiences he depicted. The presence of a child is a repeated feature in this series. Hans does not explicitly paint himself into the scenes. Instead, we get a sense that we are seeing scenes that he witnessed. We see the events from his perspective rather than standing on the outside. As well as Jewish people and members of the Nazi party, Hans frequently includes bystanders. This painting depicts a boycott on a Jewish shop. As well as the Nazis, we also have the bystanders, the passers-by. We can see a man on the left-hand side with his hands in his pocket. He seems to not want to draw attention to himself as he walks by. 
Over on the right hand side, we can see a woman listening to a Nazi who is speaking to her. He is holding a leaflet in his hand. Will she take it? Towards the centre, paused in her approach of the shop, is another woman with a shopping bag in her hand. She seems to be faced with a decision. Will she go in? Or will she turn away? In the prelude to the Holocaust, Hans Jackson reminds us that the events did not just involve members of the Nazi party and Jewish people. Bystanders played a very important role too. And art is a powerful medium for him to share his message. Through his painting, Hans could include the different people and types of people he himself witnessed. The people who tried to hurry past without being noticed. The people forced to make hard decisions. To buy from Jewish shops or turn away. The people who listened to Nazi propaganda. The children who were swept along by Nazi ideology and played a role in vandalising Jewish shops. The Nazis actively trying to turn people to their point of view. And at the top, to the left, a curtain twitches. The Jewish owners, perhaps watching these events take place. And once again, it shares these events from a Jewish perspective. The perspective of someone whose parents ran a shop and who experienced an anti-Semitic boycott. The prelude to the Holocaust, painted by Hans, is powerful and moving to look through. So what prompted him to share his story in this way? Hans explains in his recorded testimony. I think most of us, after the war, we were, aim, were aiming at survival, at finding a way of starting a life again. Yeah. And uh, I'm, there, I'm just the same as many other thousands of refugees that were in this country. We forgot all about the Holocaust. Yes. The, we, the, the ones that had children, their children never even mentioned it no. or avoided to mention it. And then, at the, well, suddenly, not suddenly, but slowly, the youngsters seemed to ask. And in the 70s to the 80s, the interest came and asked, questions were asked and people were asked, what happened? How did it happen? And that's when I started these, started off to make this set of paintings to explain what happened, how it happened, why we were unable to do anything about it. The circumstances, the way of life we lived, yeah. and uh, that's how I said how I started these paintings. Survivor testimony is an important part of Holocaust education. When we think of survivor testimony, we often think of an oral testimony. Yet Hans Jackson's artwork reminds us that testimony does not have to be spoken. Hans Jackson's Prelude to the Holocaust tells his story and forms his testimony. As we look closely at his artwork, we can find his answers to the questions he found himself being asked. What happened? How did it happen? He painted to provide his answers, to share his testimony. At the Jewish Museum London, we are extremely grateful to Leon Greenman and Hans Jackson for their artwork, which tells such an important story. They play an important role in Holocaust education at the Jewish Museum London. When students come to learn about the rise of Nazism in our workshop on the Kinder Transport, for example, they study the painting by Hans Jackson of the boycott of a Jewish shop. It is powerful in prompting discussions and reflection, just as art is a powerful means to express emotions. Art is effective in enabling young people to convey their response to the Holocaust and ideas of legacy today. In 2019, we worked with the Holocaust Educational Trust and Jamie, the mental health charity, on our Your Legacy and Me project. In this project, young people created their artwork reflecting on the theme of legacy. This currently forms an online exhibition 
as well as a physical exhibition. Our newest Holocaust workshop, Life with Loss, created in memory of survivor Solly Irving, tells his story as the sole survivor in his family. We are developing this workshop in partnership with Grief Encounter, and through it, students will explore notions of loss, what it meant to be a sole survivor, and the importance of memory in Judaism. The workshop will conclude with a creative activity where students make their own artwork in response to Solly's story. This will be launched on Holocaust Memorial Day 2022 and we will begin piloting the workshops this year. So do reach out to us if you know of a school who would like to be part of this pilot. As we move forward, art continues to play an important role in Holocaust education as a testimony and a means of expression. Thank you.